Well, as part of the celebration of Black History Month, today's program focuses on a group of brave and courageous men who are often overlooked in the telling of the early settling of our country. Dr. Daryl Milner, Chair of the Black Studies Department at Portland State University, is here today to share with us the most important historical contributions of the Buffalo Soldiers, American black soldiers who fought in the Civil War and protected American settlers on the Western Plains. In addition to providing us with an enlightening history lesson, this information can be of great value to people from all races since it demonstrates important lessons and perspectives of our shared multicultural past. Dr. Milner received his doctorate from the University of Oregon in 1971. In addition to chairing the Black Studies Department at PSU, his other administrative duties include liaison with the Black Cultural Affairs Board and chair of the Black Faculty Caucus. From 1983 to 1985, he served as the Multicultural Director for the Portland Public School System while on leave from Portland State. He has authored numerous articles and publications on black history, and he is currently a member of the Board of Referees for the National Social Science Journal and the Editorial Board for the Oregon Historical Society Quarterly. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daryl Milner to the City Club. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today, and I, I want you to understand how sincere I am about that. I had a very bad case of the flu last week, and it's a pleasure for me to be anywhere this week. <laughs> I'm also very pleased to be here because uh, some of you might remember I was here last year at about this time and spoke to you during Black History Month then as well. And uh, as I was preparing my re remarks for today, that seemed to be a pretty good arrangement to me. Uh, once a year is a nice pattern to meet your classes. And <laughs> I mentioned that to my, uh, to my president at Portland State. She wasn't quite as enthusiastic about the idea as I was. And when she suggested that she was only going to pay me once a year for that kind of schedule, I became less enthusiastic myself. <laughs> but uh, as I said, I was here last year. And at that time, I opened my uh, talk to this group by describing history as an organic entity, like a plant that continues to grow, branch, and evolve, rather than as some static, inorganic object that lacks movement, spirit, and change. And I suppose I stand by that statement still. And I'd like to offer as evidence a few examples of that spirit and that change, which have occurred in black history since we were last here together. Some of the important events of black history that have happened since I was last with the City Club include the following. Most recently, the death of Thurgood Marshall, a giant figure in the struggle for civil rights in this country and for racial progress. But more than that, a champion of the rights of all individuals against the real and the potential excesses of government power. There has been a major film in the last year made available to the public about the life of Malcolm X, a previously much neglected and distorted figure from black history that this film will go a long way uh, to presenting in a more useful and accurate package to the American public. We've also added another black female to the political community of Oregon in that time, Ms. Avell Gordley, recently elected to the Oregon legislature. And we have elected a black man for the first time to a statewide governmental office in Oregon, Mr. Jim Hill, who will be our new state treasurer. On the national scene, Arizona has finally recognized the birthday of Martin Luther King. And finally, as an example of how events of past history can still have an impact on our lives today, you should remember that if only whites could have voted in the last presidential election, as had been the pattern of past generations of American racial history, George Bush would still be president, having won, as he did, a majority of the white votes cast. So black history is still with us, and black history is still occurring all around us. And perhaps I'll have some more things to talk about if I'm with you again next year. Now, there's another part of my presentation from last year I would like to refer to briefly this morning. In discussing some of the shortcomings of the traditional history uh, in dealing with the black past, I suggested the following last year. I said, if we accept the responsibility to respond to this corrupted history, 
We must be purposeful and systematic to ensure our responses will contribute to a solution rather than create new problems. And then I went on to recommend a three-step approach. I said the first step would be to re-educate yourself, to read, to talk, to think, to take classes, to argue, but to involve yourself in the process of a re-examination of what you thought you knew about our world and how it got to be that way. I said the next step would be, when possible, to contribute to the cleansing of material and the explanations that function to continue the effects of previous miseducation and inaccurate history. And the final step I suggested was to encourage and to support new research and the development of new information committed to the pursuit and the finding of truth about our multiracial and our multicultural past. Now, I'm not so sure I would have given you such strenuous advice if I would have known beforehand that you were going to actually expect me to help you do it. But I suppose that's what we're here about today. And we are here to try and replace some of that missing information about the black past as we look at a group called the Buffalo Soldiers. I suppose the best way to start that process is by asking several questions and providing you at least what I consider to be reasonable answers. We can start by asking who will we be discussing today? Who was this group that we call the Buffalo Soldiers? The Buffalo Soldiers were a group of black soldiers who were active in the Indian Wars and the activities of Western settlement from the end of the Civil War beginning in 1866 to the last significant Indian, Indian battle that took place, strangely enough, in the 20th century, in 1918, in the Arizona Territory against the Yaqui Indians. During this period, the U.S. Cavalry had 10 regiments in the West, and of those 10, two were all black cavalry units, the 9th and the 10th Cavalry. Thus, during this era, the black cavalry represented fully 20 percent of the American cavalry presence in the West. Although you will never even suspect this, just from the traditional sources of culture and scholarly treatments of these years that we're usually exposed to. In addition to the two cavalry units, there were two colored regiments of infantry in the West, the 24th and the 25th regiments. These were the people that we call the Buffalo Soldiers. Now another reasonable question is why do we call them by that phrase? What does the term Buffalo Soldiers mean? They were so named by their Indian adversaries, by the opponents who they contended with for so many years. Early in their tenure in the West, uh, they were given that name, and there are several versions of why that name was attached to this group of black soldiers. One asserts that the Indians considered the black soldiers as truly worthy adversaries, who possessed great strength, stamina, and perseverance, just like the buffalo they also revered. And it was thus a sign of great respect. And it's also been suggested that the dark features of these troops and their woolly hair were physical attributes that supported this association with the buffaloes of the plains. And finally, in their winter campaigns in the early years, some units of the buffalo soldiers wore full-length buffalo robes to keep them warm. And this was something that enhanced the symbolism and attached that, uh, that particular uh, vision entitled to the Buffalo Soldiers Group. Now there is no doubt that it was offered as a tribute of respect by the Indians and it was accepted as such with pride and affection by the Buffalo Troopers themselves who adopted it and embraced it and included it in their regimental insignia. Perhaps you might be interested to know how I became interested in the story of the Buffalo Soldiers and that's a story that goes back to my early youth. I can remember still very clearly my first interaction with these men. It came in a small California neighborhood theater in 1961, and it came in the form of a, a, a very poor B movie titled Captain Rutledge. And it was starring a gentleman named Woody Strode, and it focused on his character, a sergeant in the Buffalo Soldiers who had been brought up on court-martial charges for rape and murder of a white woman in the American West. Now, I think you can uh, predict how the story would unfold and how it would, uh, how it would climax. Eventually he is exonerated, but the images of these black soldiers were so new 
and so unexpected to the eyes of a young black boy who had grown to uh, that stage on the images of John Wayne and the Gunsmoke traditions on television, I was hooked and I possessed a deep interest from that point on in the story of these black troopers who were a part of that Western experience. That curiosity and that admiration I have had uh, about the Buffalo Soldiers ever since. And it's been my good fortune as someone who is actually paid to research and teach about black history to have had the subsequent opportunity to study their story in more detail. Now a final question that you might ask about the Buffalo Soldiers has to do with their connection to Oregon. What do the Buffalo Soldiers have to do with Oregon history, you might ask? And the answer, a lot more than you might think. I'll only give a few examples to suggest the very many significant connections between these men and this history. At various times, some of these Buffalo Soldiers were actually stationed in the Pacific Northwest, included in Oregon. They were used, for example, to break the strikes of the railroad workers in Montana and Idaho in the 1890s, protecting the railroads and the mail delivery in those areas. The 24th Infantry was stationed right here at Fort Vancouver across the Columbia River at the turn of the century. And many black troopers served in other posts in the Pacific Northwest in places like Spokane, Washington. Perhaps the most famous of the local black buffalo soldiers that you might want to become acquainted with was a gentleman named Moses Williams. Moses Williams still resides in the former Oregon Territory. Moses Williams won distinction as a buffalo soldier when he won the Congressional Medal of Honor in a battle with the uh, Apache Indians in New Mexico in 1881. His last postings were to the Northwest. He served for a time as the commander of Fort Stevens on the Oregon coast. And that was a very unusual arrangement, both because he was a black man and only a sergeant at the time. And his final post was at Fort Vancouver, where he died in August of 1899, and where you can still visit his grave in the, port, uh, in the Fort Vancouver Cemetery across the river, nestled close to I-5. Now, in addition to the black Buffalo Soldier in individuals who came to the Oregon Territory, there were a number of Oregon military figures who were intimately associated with the Buffalo Soldiers over their career in the West. And I'll just mention a few names and perhaps talk in more detail about them later. But they include figures like Ulysses S. Grant, who spent some of his early military career at Fort Vancouver and was later instrumental in the Civil War in using many of the black troops who would go on to be Buffalo Soldiers in the American West. You might be familiar with some of that story from the movie Glory that came out a few years ago. Philip Sheridan, the Union general who Sheridan, Oregon is named after, was a commander of Buffalo Soldiers at a number of points in his career. And it was Philip Sheridan or under his direction that the 9th Cavalry was originally uh, organized and constituted in the Louisiana area in 1866. General Sherman of the March on Georgia fame, commanded Buffalo Soldiers in the Indian Wars for many of the 20 years that he was in the West following the Civil War. Black Jack Pershing, the man most famous for his leading the American Expeditionary Force in World War I, started his military career as a commander in the Buffalo Soldiers, the 10th Cavalry. So many of the people who we associate with uh, the dominant movements and events of American military history are also associated in a very intimate way with the Buffalo Soldiers that we talk about today. And in many times, their association goes back to early Oregon roots. But beyond the specifics of the connections between Oregon and this Buffalo Soldier group, I think there's another significance that makes their, uh, that makes their story an important one for us to talk about today. And that involves correcting this omission of the role that the Buffalo Soldiers played in Western and American development. There is a contribution that that story can make to the modern world of Oregon in 1993. Our appreciation of the barriers and the difficulties they faced and rose above can still provide inspiration and perhaps even direction to modern youth as they struggle with our own demons and dilemmas in terms of our racial context. The qualities that they possessed, like self-discipline, hard work, perseverance, surely have at least as much value in our Oregon today 
as they had to the Buffalo Soldiers in their trials and tribulations of the 19th century. Our awareness of the battles won in that generation may give us an added appreciation of the opportunities and the relative good fortune we may find in our own in spite of the lingering problems of race and economic difficulties that we still wrestle with. And finally, the revelation of their contribution, not just to their race, but to this country, can remind us, can remind us all that if things are to continue to change, if we are con going to continue to progress, there is a continuing responsibility that we all have as individuals to make that change occur. And perhaps in a bit more abstract sense, to tell this story is to tell the truth. And last year in my, my remarks to the City Club, I suggested that the search for truth leads to the study of black history. And that statement can be uh, just as true today, and I believe it is just as true in regards to our interactions with this story of the Buffalo Soldiers. Now at this point I want to shift gears a bit and move away from these semi-structured and formal remarks to a more episodic consideration of, this, of uh, that Buffalo Soldier story. And since the river of that story is so broad and the significance yet is deep, about the only way it can be approached, given the limitations of the time that we have today, is to approach that story through pathways that may already be familiar to you for one reason or another. I will talk of the parts of that story that involve names and events that you may be acquainted with from your regular history, that is the, right, the white history that you might have received in other times and in other places, both formally and informally as you grew to adulthood. I think you will be amazed at how, you can, uh, at how much you already know and of the things that you didn't know regarding the relationship of these Buffalo soldiers to the figures of Western history and American history that have become icons uh, and heroes for us. But there's one final thing I need to do before I talk about the specifics of the Buffalo Soldier story. And it involves an irony of the Buffalo Soldier experience, in particular their relationship to the native populations of the American West. And this must be said before we begin this examination. We do not do this examination to glorify military conquest or the manifest destiny theories that dominated that period. There was a tremendous irony in the role that the Buffalo Soldiers played in imposing white rule on the natives of the West, considering their own very recent association with the institution of slavery. This was a role not lost at times on either the men or the officers of these colored units. It was not infrequent for the military officers and the troops in the field to feel quite acutely a sympathy for the Indians that they opposed. And I want to share that, that, uh, that feeling and that sympathy with you uh, by reading you a description of a quote from General Pope who commanded many of these troops in the West during these Indian wars. Uh, when the Buffalo soldiers were fighting Geronimo and Victoria and the Chiricahua, the Warm Springs and the Mescalero Indians in the New Mexico area, in the 1840s. And this is a description from the leading authority on Buffalo soldiers, a man named William, William Leckie. And he says this about this particular aspect of their presence in the West. He says, General Pope wrote angrily to Sheridan that the source of the trouble was simply a lack of food, which the Bureau, the Indian Bureau, should have supplied. And that the Ninth Cavalry had been placed in the near intolerable position of forcing the Indians to either starve to death on their reservations or killing them if they left it. And it was that kind of ambiguity and contradiction uh, that we need to appreciate and understand about the role of these former slave black soldiers as they impose these restrictions on the native populations of the West. Now as I start a more specific discussion of some of the details of their story in the West, I think it's only fair to talk about, in general, the conditions that all of the American military, including the cavalry and the infantry in the West, faced as they fought, uh, as they fought that difficult battle of expansion. And I'll use for that purpose a quotation from uh, General Philip Sheridan, who was at this time uh, in charge of the District of, uh, of Texas, where many of the Buffalo soldiers were stationed. And uh, in describing the conditions that those soldiers faced, he issued perhaps one of his most famous quotations. 
And he said it this way. He said, if I was to become the owner of both Texas and hell, I'd rent out Texas and live in hell. <laughs> now, I don't want to offend any Texans in the audience, <laughs> but that will give you a feel for the kind of conditions that these men were facing uh, in this time period. The 9th and 10th Cavalries were the colored infantry of the period, and they went west in 1867. They remained in the West for 20 years, well into the 1890s. And typically, the regiments were scattered over a wide area with various companies of the troop at one post or another. It was very infrequent that the whole regiment was gathered at one place. What kind of work did they do? Well, we know they fought the Indians because we watched the movies. We don't see them, but we see the cavalry performing that role. But beyond that role, the soldiers in the West did other things as well. They protected stage lines and they protected wagon trains. They built the roads, they built the telegraphs, uh, they even contributed to building the railroads of the period. They scouted and they did what we would call today policing duties, especially in areas like the Panhandle of Texas that were overrun by bandits and uh, invaders from Mexico and hostile Indians and uh, bad guys of all kinds. So these are the jobs that the Buffalo soldiers were responsible for as they moved into this western arena. Just a little bit of that story, a little bit of the details of where they were and what their assignments were. The 9th Cavalry was in West Texas for eight years, from 1867 to 1875. Uh, they had garrisoned the worst posts, posts like Fort Concho. They dealt with all the desperados and all the difficulties of that era. If we watch uh, representations of that era on TV or in the movies today, most of the credit and all of the attention is given to a group called the Texas Rangers. The Texas Rangers were much smaller in number. Uh, many people argue much less effective in taming that area. Yet the role of the Buffalo Soldiers, as important as it was, is lost to our understanding and our appreciation. In 1876, the undermanned 10th Cavalry was the only cavalry unit in West Texas. And although the movies of that period include uh, the John Waynes and the Ronald Reagans of uh, movie fame, we see rarely the Buffalo Soldiers represented. They were indeed the military American presence that made that part of the West uh, available for settlement and development. I want to talk for a minute about some of the special difficulties that these black troops faced in the West. And those difficulties came in many forms and in many brands. The officers of the 10th Cavalry frequently and probably very accurately complained that they only received the worn out and the unfit horses of the 7th Cavalry, the more famous uh, brothers of the 10th, uh, commanded by General Custard, of course, and only uh, were issued used and repaired equipment. And these complaints were accurate. In addition to these kind of equipment difficulties, relations between officers and men could sometimes reflect the patterns of racial oppression that were typical of the era. The Buffalo Soldier story was not immune from those racial patterns that dominated the period. Just give you one example. A white officer shot and killed two of his privates, but was only required to resign from the army as his punishment. And this is, if not typical, at least representative of the potential for those kind of difficulties even within the Buffalo Soldier units. The Buffalo Soldier units were colored units but with one exception, over the course of a 25-year period, all of the officers were white. That was consistent with the policy of the day. Sometimes in the West, the Buffalo Soldier units, whether they were infantry or cavalry, uh, uh, came into difficult conflict with the other American military units in the West that were all white units. This was, to a degree, predictable. Uh, racial hostility was common, was the norm in this period. And sometimes the most difficult tensions, the most uh, strenuous fighting occurred not between the American troops and their Indian opponents, but sometimes between the American troops and other American troops. This was also true of the relationship of the Buffalo Soldiers to many of the local citizens that they were there to protect. There were great difficulties over the course of the 30-year period, the 25-year period they were in the West, between the Buffalo Soldiers, <coughs> excuse me, and the citizens of some of the towns and areas that they were designed to protect. Thank you. These difficulties reached such a point in 1875 in Texas that Secretary of War William Belknap telegraphed the governor of Texas, a gentleman named Cook, 
that if harassment of federal troops, that is uh, the 9th and the 24th Fourth Infantry that were stationed in Texas, did not stop, he would simply remove all the troops from that locality. So this is reflective of the kind of special difficulties that the black troops had to deal with. Uh, their problems were especially severe in their relationships with the Texas Rangers. The Texas Rangers were a group of, uh, in, in many ways, very active and courageous individuals, but they tended to be from the former Confederate states in, uh, in the Civil War, and that did not improve their understanding or their sympathy of these Buffalo Soldiers. And they also tended to be a bit jealous of the role that the Buffalo Soldiers played in uh, policing the West. So there were often difficulties, sometimes amounting to shootouts, uh, fist fights, uh, and various difficulties of that kind that occurred between the Buffalo Soldiers and other forces of authority in the Western area. I'll give you one example of that. In January in 1881, uh, a, a black private named William Watkins was shot in the head and killed in cold blood by a citizen named Tom McCarty. He was a white local in St. Angelo, which was the, uh, the, the, the town post right next to uh, Fort Concho in Texas. The black troopers the next day rode into the town and shot it up. McCarthy was eventually uh, acquitted of this murder by an all-white jury in Austin, Texas, and received no punishment. Now, those difficulties were in some ways unique for the black troops. But that did, not, uh, that did not allow them to shirk their duty, uh, the reason that they had been sent to the West. And black troops were involved in all of the famous Indian wars and famous activities that have uh, become familiar to us for various reasons from those Western encounters. I'll mention just a few uh, as we go on, but one thing I do want to say before uh, we enter that section of the presentation, there needs to be an appreciation for the reason that black troops were in the West from the perspective of the black troops themselves. The Civil War had been the event that had convinced the country that black troops or black men could be effective uh, fighting men. But the country had its reasons for using the black troops and the black troops had their own reasons for being available. During the Civil War, they obviously fought to end the institution of slavery. Following the Civil War, the opportunities for black men to do anything other than serve in the military uh, was simply not that attractive. So one of the reasons that the blacks were involved in this activities was a matter of lack of choice, a matter of a lack of other opportunities. And this is reflected in some of the uh, statistics about retention and desertion rates that we can see from the Western cavalry experience. I'll give you some examples of desertion rates just to give you the comparison opportunities that might have been available to black as compared to white military uh, members in this period. In 1877, a representative year, the 3rd Cavalry had 170 desertions. The 4th Cavalry had 184. The 5th Cavalry had 224. Custer's, uh, or formerly Custer's 7th Cavalry had 172. The 8th Cavalry, 174. The 9th Cavalry, the black troops had six during that period. Now, I want to mention just a few uh, names and individuals and events uh, that were a part of that Buffalo Soldier story that you might be familiar with for other reasons. Uh, a name that comes to us if we know anything or have any interest in the cavalry experience in the American West is George Armstrong Custer, uh, a great military hero in the Civil War, goes on to fame and perhaps not fortune uh, in, a, in a battle later in his, uh, his military career. But in 1866, Custard was offered a commission in one of the black regiments that was being formed. Custard declined that commission uh, by observing that he had no interest in serving with what he described as our brunette troops. And he went on to be a member of the 7th Cavalry and to the fate that awaited him there. Other names and individuals that were associated with the Buffalo Soldiers. Wild Bill Hickok, Buffalo Bill Cote, both men served as scouts for the Buffalo Soldiers in General Philip Sher uh, Sheridan's winter campaign in 1867 and 68 against the uh, Cheyennes and the Arapahoes. Hickok serving, for, uh, serving as a scout for the B, F, G, and H troops of the 10th Cavalry in that particular, uh, in that particular encounter. Buffalo Bill Cote serving in other units in, in another branch of that campaign. Another well-known figure from this period, Kit Carson, also served as a scout for the Buffalo Soldiers. Although I suspect that in all of the movies and all of the articles that you've read about 
Hickok and Cody and Kit Carson, you have never seen a reference or an image that associates them with this Buffalo Soldier story. Another name that might be surprising to you, a man who's famous in American life for another reason, Abner Doubleday, the man who is sometimes given credit for inventing baseball. On December the 15th in 1870, Abner Doubleday became the commander of the 24th Colored Infantry in Texas, and he served in that post until December of 1873. One of the most famous events in Western history involves uh, a series of activities that took place in the New Mexico area in a place called Lincoln County. And some of the, uh, the most well-known names of Western lore come to us from this particular series of events. Uh, names like Billy the Kid, John Chisholm, uh, Pat Garrett, some of the other individuals that get the books and the movies made about them. What you generally don't understand or are, uh, have any exposure to about the Lincoln County War is a role that black troops played there. And indeed it was the Black Ninth Cavalry that determined the outcome of the Lincoln County War and the fate of people like Alexander McSween uh, and John Tunstale, the, uh, the combatants in this particular encounter. It was the Ninth Cavalry under Lieutenant Colonel Dudley who was stationed at Fort Stanford right next to Lincoln, the city of Lincoln in New Mexico that swung the weight of victory in the direction of what at this time was called the Murphy Dolan faction. And we don't have time today to go through all the in intricacies of uh, who was on what side and what the outcome of the war was. But Lieutenant Dudley, uh, in expressed opposition or in active opposition to uh, orders that were both verbally and written uh, in, in a written form given to him to stay neutral in the conflict, rode into Lincoln, uh, New Mexico in July of 1878 and threw his weight, that is the weight of the Buffalo Soldiers and a Gatling gun and a howitzer on the part of one side of that particular conflict. They were the people who were responsible for uh, burning the house that Billy the Kid and Alexander McSween were, uh, were holed up in at the time and chasing those individuals out of town and uh, resulting in a number of deaths of some of the leading combatants in this particular Lincoln County War. The story of the 9th Cavalry does not appear on the Young Guns TV show or in the movie that you see uh, representing this particular conflict, but indeed they were the people who determined the outcome of the Lincoln County War. Names like Geronimo, Geronimo the Apache warrior that ravaged uh, from the perspective of the Americans anyway, the American Southwest in the New Mexico and the Arizona area in the 1880s. Geronimo eventually captured and sent to Florida to remove that menace from the American West. The troops that pursued Geronimo, both in the Southwest and across the Mexican border uh, into Northern Mexico, wore his troops down, uh, harassed them, uh, made them vulnerable to the final capture with the 9th and 10th Cavalry stationed in Arizona at the time. Another event that is uh, familiar to you if you are uh, an, an enthusiast for Indian history, Native American history. A very famous event occurs in 1890 and 1891. We call it the Ghost Dance Campaign. The Ghost Dance Campaign was in many ways the final great response of the Plains Indians to this uh, reservation and entrapment uh, series of, uh, of events that had really dramatically changed their whole cultural experience. The Ghost Dance Campaign in 1890 resulted in many events that have come down to us and still play very much a part in the relationships between the U.S. government and our, and our current Indian populations. Uh, names like the Rosebud Incident, uh, the Ghost Dance itself, the massacre that took place at Wounded Knee. All of these events are a part of the Ghost Dance story in 1890 and 91. The part that is often left out is the role played by the Buffalo Soldiers. The 9th Cavalry was among the units called into uh, and around Pine Butt, Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservation in 1890 to put down the Ghost Dance Scare. And although they did not participate in the massacre at Wounded Knee, that was done by the 7th Cavalry, probably in revenge for uh, an earlier encounter they had with the Sioux that you might know something about. The next day, there was a significant battle at a place called Drexel Mission, where the Cheyennes and their allies had surrounded the 7th Cavalry and were in the process of exterminating them, much as they had done Custer 20 years before or 15 years before. And it was the 9th Cavalry that rode to the rescue and swept the hills uh, that surrounded the 7th Cavalry and got them out of that uh, entrapment. So the Buffalo Soldiers were there uh, in the Ghost Dance campaign in very significant ways. A name I mentioned earlier, 
the name of a man, Black Jack Pershing. And if you study American history of the 20th century, you know that Black Jack Pershing was the commander of the American Expeditionary Force in World War I uh, that we sent to rescue our European allies from, uh, from that particular conflict. But perhaps you've wondered where Black Jack got that nickname. And if you know the Buffalo Soldier story, uh, there are no mysteries and no surprise there. Black Jack Pershing got his military career started as a commander in the Buffalo Soldiers, the 10th Cavalry as a lieutenant. <coughs> Strangely enough, stationed in the Northwest, working uh, in Montana during the 1890s. The next significant involvement that Black Jack had with the Buffalo Soldiers came in his Mexico campaign in 1916, when Black Jack led the American expeditionary forces not to Europe, but to our southern border uh, and across it into Mexico, chasing Pancho Villa. The men chasing Pancho Villa and, and conflicting with him in 1916 included a significant portion of the Buffalo Soldiers, the 10th Cavalry and the 24th and the 25th Infantry. And finally, Black Jack Pershing, with that nickname firmly attached, goes on to fame in World War I. Many of these individuals trace their military experience to this association with the Buffalo Soldiers. Other individuals who were active in, that, in, in, in a similar way and had a similar association. General Crook, uh, perhaps the most famed Indian fighter of the Northwest and of uh, the Western arena. When the Buffalo Soldiers were stationed in Arizona for much of the 1880s and 90s, he was the commander of their forces there. We've talked already about Philip Sheridan, the role that he played in the initiation of the 9th Cavalry uh, and in directing their activities in the Texas and in the southwestern area. So many of these individuals share this common thread of experience. General Sherman of Civil War fame, General Sherman when he headed the Department of the Missouri, his forces in Kansas, Missouri, and Indian Territory and New Mexico included only three cavalry regiments, the 3rd, the 7th, the one that we are, are most familiar with, and the 10th. That meant that in General Sherman's Western career, fully one-third of his cavalry strength was represented by the Black Buffalo Soldiers. In these ways now, the story of the Black Buffalo Soldiers is an intimate part of our understanding of the American West. If we omit it, if we leave it out, we cannot understand that larger story. And so in addition to all the, uh, the contemporary and personal reasons that an individual might be interested in the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, if you're interested in Western history, if you're interested in American history at all, you want the full and complete story, you need to become more familiar with these individuals. Uh, this is going to be the end of my formal remarks today, and uh, I'll try to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Milner. We'll take the first question from Gail Johnson, followed by one from Martha Radakovich, and then we'll open it up to remarks from anyone else in the audience who would like to ask a question. First of all, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to say thank you for all of your work that I believe is on my behalf. <laughs> and I wanted to also speak a little bit about a professor that I had at uh, PCC that talked about there is no such thing, literally, as black history. It is all history. What we are doing is teaching the continuum and putting the pieces back in that have been omitted or deleted. In that vein, how do you see the inclusion of these omitted pieces of history being put back, either in the media, specifically Hollywood, or very close to home through our educational system in classes or books? I'm used to asking the questions. I don't have to answer them. Then. <laughs> well, you know, I think really that's the responsibility of this generation. And one thing that I try to encourage people to remember is that in terms of our racial history, the kind of context that produced the, uh, the problems we have uh, in, 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 in these omissions, the problems we have in telling a complete and honest story about the past, that particular legacy comes to us from 300 years of American slavery and racial oppression. 300 years is a long time, three centuries. Now, we've had 30 years of trying to do it a different way, 30 years of uh, American history in which white superiority has not been official public policy. And 
in 30 years, you're not going to be able to reverse and eradicate that 300-year year history. So I think each generation might identify for itself a particular responsibility. Our responsibility, I think, is to acknowledge that past and to begin the process of, uh, of acknowledging the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the need for correction, okay? And if we only do that, I, uh, as a member of this generation, would be satisfied. And I think we've come a long way towards that. You know, I think Portland has been, in many ways, in the forefront of that process. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we've had community activists. We've had interactions with the school district here. Uh, we have a university that has the only black studies program in the state of Oregon in the Pacific Northwest. So I think we've met that responsibility that this generation has of acknowledging the problem, analyzing the omissions, and establishing a context in which we know that there is a need to replace this distorted history, this misinformation, with the true and accurate picture of the past. So in one sense, I think we have, uh, we have done a good deal in that, in that uh, effect, in that respect. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do that by giving people the opportunity to become acquainted with this information uh, in an individual way, in a personal way. And my experience has been that once that begins to happen, once you find out about the Buffalo Soldiers, and once you compare uh, even the small amount of information that you might have with the absence of information that was typical of your prior education, then you become almost obsessed with finding more information. And I think it's that obsession process that is going to carry us to the next step. Uh, the information is compelling. The information is interesting. It, uh, it activates you in terms of, be uh, of encouraging you to become an active learner. So I'm really not worried about this generation. I think we have done what we need to do. We have recognized the inadequacies of the approaches that we have taken in the past, and we've begun to, uh, to offer appetizers of information. And that's really what we've, we've done here today. And as you find these appetizers of information becoming more and more available, I think we'll energize many more people and, and perhaps a whole culture to try and create a, uh, a story of our past that's going to be more complete and more useful to us. Dr. Belner, Martha Radakovich, Arts and Culture Subcommittee. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you about, uh, oh, thank you for a riveting story. You know, we uh, often hear about the Black Squadron. I had never heard about the uh, Buffalo Soldiers before. and. Uh, I would like to know, not only do we have any Buffalo Soldiers today, and uh, also who, you know, in, in the East we have, uh, we had Martin Luther King and we had uh, Andrew Young, the mayor of Atlanta, and, and Mr. Dinkins, and, and uh, lots of wonderful people. Who are the people in the West that are gonna be the leaders in, in this movement? I, uh, I would uh, like to hear you, your remarks on that, thank you. Okay, uh, the, the policy of, of maintaining segregated units in the American military is no longer uh, official policy. Uh, and that ended, I believe, in 1948. Uh, President Truman was responsible for that. So after 1948, we were not going to have any Buffalo Soldier units. We were going to have integrated units. But what we have today I think in many places in the American military community are the spiritual descendants of the Buffalo Soldiers. And perhaps the, uh, the most prominent one today is Colin Powell. Colin Powell uh, has been very active in preserving the memory and the information that we need to preserve about the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, so I think in that regards, we don't have any of these segregated units anymore, but we do have uh, the descendants in, in the spiritual sense, the emotional sense of that particular aspect of American military history. I understand that. I was talking more in a general sense. Who are the people who are out doing the adventurous things that the Buffalo Soldiers did at that time in history? <laughs> I think if I had to answer that as honestly as possible, uh, you might not be comfortable with the answer because I, su I suspect the answer uh, are the Crips and the Bloods. Uh, the youth gangs that we deal with today in, in, in America's streets, uh, in, in, in the urban areas. In many ways, they are facing similar difficulties and, and similar challenges as the Buffalo Soldiers did. I don't think they're facing it with the kind of self-discipline and the kind of mission and organization that the Buffalo Soldiers did, but they are in a similar situation. 
They are in a generation of American life 100 years later in which the opportunities for them are very few and which the, uh, the combat that is required of them is very serious. Now, I don't know if the, the country will benefit from their activities as much as it did from that of the Buffalo Soldiers, but these are the young men of the black community today, and these are the battles that they fight against each other, against the police, against society at large, and uh, I, I think we need to understand the circumstances that they are wrestling with as an extension of the same circumstances that forced the Buffalo Soldiers into the conflicts that they engaged in 100 years before. Vivian Solomon, City Club member. I'd be interested in hearing about the family life of the Buffalo Soldiers and particularly what role, if any, black women played during that uh, event period in our history. The Buffalo Soldiers rarely had a family life. And uh, their family, the, buff the family of the Buffalo Soldier was the regiment or the company in which they served. Uh, there were very few black females on the frontier, uh, and that's not to say that they were completely absent. But the lifestyle and the conditions and the circumstances of the Buffalo Soldiers' existence did not encourage any kind of a sedimentary family development. So the Buffalo Soldiers were essentially a family of men in the American West. Now, there were females present, and there's some interesting stories about that. Uh, much of the social activity of the Buffalo Soldiers centered around the post towns that grew up next to the, uh, the bases that they were stationed at. <coughs> Excuse me. So they would not be the kind of things that you would want your third and fourth grade classes to study about. Uh, and there's one uh, particularly interesting case of the only black officer that served with the Buffalo Soldiers in the 19th century. His name was uh, Henry Flipper. Uh, the first black graduate of West Point. And he served with the Buffalo Soldiers of 10th Cavalry beginning in 1878. Uh, and I suppose he was wrestling with this very same question. There was an absence of black women. Uh, there were, however, available some white women occasionally near the post. And uh, he was at Fort Concho in 1878, and he found a writing companion, one of the white ladies in, uh, in the adjourning town. Her former writing companion happened to be one of his white officer uh, compatriots, and Flipper ran into some difficulties because of that in the racial circumstances of the day. Uh, he was eventually transferred to another post. Eventually, some, uh, some charges were trumped up uh, about him stealing money from the Fort Commissary, and he was cashiered out of the Army, and he tried for the next 30 years to get back in and have his reputation cleared. But those are the circumstances uh, as far as family life and sexual realities that the Buffalo Soldiers had to deal with. There were essentially no black females available to them. White females were unavailable for other reasons. So the family of the Buffalo Soldier was the company or the unit that they served in. Dr. Mil Milner, thank you for uh, the information that you've given. I came in kind of late. My name is Larry Thompson. I'm a private citizen. My question is, is there a hall of records, per se, for black members of the Union Army or of the Buffalo Soldiers? And if so, where can I find that? I'm doing some genealogy, and <coughs> my great-grandfather was a surgeon in the uh, Civil War, and I'm trying to follow that up. There's going to be no one place that you can go to, uh, to pursue that interest. But one of the fortunate things about the military experience is that they are almost obsessed with keeping records. Okay. <laughs> So you're not going to have any difficulty in tracing down someone whose name you know and whose connection with the military you might, you might have some information about. Uh, perhaps the best thing for me to do would be to talk to you a little bit after the presentation. But if you go to many of the, uh, the former parts, the former posts and camps of the West that Buffalo Soldiers served at, uh, very frequently they will have records preserved there for you with pictures and, and uh, diaries and you know, records of their activities there. Uh, so the military has kept very extensive records about all of the black troops that were active in the Civil War, in the Buffalo Soldier era, in, in all of the activities since that time. And I'll, I'll, I'll be able to suggest some places to you in, uh, in private after this, uh, this presentation. My name is Rhett Dillian. and I'm a City Club member. Are the lectures you're giving later this month going to be a repetition of today or an expansion on uh, the information? I'm hoping there'll be an improvement, <laughs> but you never can tell. But basically, we'll be covering the same, uh, the same ground, the same information. Uh, 
David Shannon, City Club member. Would you recommend one or two books, anthologies or something that might give a flavor of this? And does the Oregon Historical Society have any books in its uh, resources of, of interest too? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not so sure that the Oregon Historical Society does, but I know that Powell's Bookstore does. And the, uh, the one best source, the one best reference for the Buffalo Soldier story is a book by a man named Leckie called The Buffalo Soldiers. And I've seen it on the shelves at Powell's, uh, written in 1971, but still the most authoritative and complete history of that, uh, that particular experience. But the Buffalo Soldiers have generated a good deal of scholarly interest in the last few years, and there'll be some other things that will be coming out shortly. There's also a videotape that's available uh, now that carries much of this information. It's probably uh, more useful in kind of a classroom setting than for personal use, but I can give you that information if you're interested in that as well. Dr. Milner, Claudette Levert, Collier City Club member. I have a question. The question is, why through the history that Afro-Americans and Native Americans have been so intertwined, and as of lately, can you explain why half of our population of uh, Afro-Americans has half of their heritage to the Native American? Will you accept no as an answer? Okay. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the history of American race is, is a complicated story, and we certainly don't have time this afternoon to, uh, to explore it in great detail. But although the theory of race in this country had, had always propagated this idea of mutual racial isolation and racial purity, that had never been the practice, okay? It wasn't the practice under American slavery. That's why if you look around the room today, you will see, in quotes, black people of every color here because there was a good deal of interaction between the, the males of the slave master class and the females of the slave class. Uh, the same was true on the American frontier uh, for slightly different reasons. In terms of the relationship between blacks and, and, and Indians on the frontier, they were intimately associated with each other because they occupied the same status in American society. They were outsiders, they were the outcasts. So economically, uh, they had the same uh, difficulties, the same lack of resources uh, that threw them into close association with each other, uh, especially in places like what we call the Indian territories or the Oklahoma, Kansas area today. So there were, I guess you might call it a conspiracy of circumstances, both historic and economic and social, that threw blacks and Native Americans very frequently together. And blacks and Native Americans, in spite of what the theories of the day suggested, are human beings. And human beings in close proximity act in a very predictable way. Dr. Miller, Norm Maves, Oregonian. I'm interested in a little in the training of the cavalry units. Were, there, were these people predominantly cavalry regiments in the Civil War who carried over, or were they trained in Louisiana? How did they go from the Civil War to active cavalry in the West? They were not previously cavalry units in the Civil War, although interestingly enough, the first black cavalry units, although we couldn't really call them Buffalo Soldiers, uh, uh, they appeared in the American Revolution, not in the Indian War period, and they, they appeared fighting not on the American side, but very reasonably and logically on the English side. Uh, if you're a slave, you're not necessarily greatly inspired to help your slave master conduct a war. You're, you're more inspired to help your slave master's enemy. And so many black Americans in the uh, revolutionary period joined the English side, and one of those, uh, or contingent of them, were organized into the first black cavalry union in the American experience during that particular war. But the Buffalo Soldiers themselves were organized beginning in 1866. Many had experience in the Civil War, but not as cavalry, uh, not as cavalry units. And they learned that experience the hard way. They learned it while they were, while, while they were fighting. While they were training, they were also actively uh, protecting and involved in that Western experience. Now, they stayed in the West for a long period of time. Uh, some individuals who joined the regiments in the 1860s remained in those regiments until the 1890s for the kind of reasons that we've discussed. But there was also a continuous influx of new members, and so it was an ongoing training process for them. So uh, I, I suppose the best answer to your question is they learn the hard way. They learn by doing. Jim Bocci, City Club member. 
1993, we are celebrating the Oregon Trail seven state celebration, talking about the westward migration. Uh, the stories you have shared with us today deal mainly with uh, cavalry and uh, battles in the Midwest, the Southwest. What type, uh, what impact did blacks have on the Oregon Trail and how the settlement of the Oregon Territory took place? Is there some significant history there? If there is, how is that being represented through the celebration that's coming up? Well, to answer the first part of your question, yes, there's significant black history there. Uh, the second part of the question in, in terms of how it's going to be reflected now is an ongoing process. But I think the people who are involved in organizing this, uh, this observation, uh, they understand the need for that. And they have, I think, made a serious uh, attempt, if you call giving me a telephone call, a serious attempt uh, to begin that process. So yes, I think we're going to include that kind of information in the observation. I'll just give you a few examples of the kind of presence that blacks had in, in the Oregon story. It starts at the very beginning. Probably the first black people who came to Oregon came as early as the 1570s. And they probably came here as a part of an English expedition with Francis Drake. Now some people don't think that Drake made it, made it all the way to Oregon. I, I kind of think that he did. And if he did, he brought the first black people with him. So the Oregon black experience probably is at least that old. The first documentation we have of a black person in Oregon came in uh, 1788 with a man named Marcus Lopius who came here with Captain Gray in that year. And we know he was here because the, uh, the diaries, the logs of that journey record his, uh, his execution by the Tillamook Indians on the coast. So in a sense, he was kind of in the spirit of the Buffalo Soldiers as well. Um, but all through the early 1800s, black people came to the Oregon Territory from many directions and, uh, and, and for many motivations. We lose that when we look at Oregon only as a, a Caucasian experience. But in the early years, especially during the fur trading years, when the Hudson Bay Company was active here with their multinational approach to fur trading, uh, they had many French Canadians and, and French Canadian and, and, and Indian offspring, and uh, the Spaniards were here in great numbers. The Spanish brought blacks uh, by the hundreds into the California and the Northwestern area from the 1600s on. So black people were present in Oregon in many, many ways. Uh, in the fur trading period, one of the first American efforts to, uh, uh, to explore and settle and discover Oregon that took place in the 1820s was led by a man named Jedediah Smith, a name that some people are familiar with. Uh, there was a famous massacre uh, in southern Oregon called the Umpqua Massacre in 1827. One of the people who was massacred and killed there was a black man, man named uh, John Rainey because blacks were sprinkled all through the American fur trade. And our images of the mountain man period and the exploring period are pretty much Caucasian, but the reality was this. Think about it. The West was dangerous. Being in the West was hard work. Why did black people come to the Western Hemisphere? They came to do the dangerous hard work that white people didn't want to do. So it should not surprise us that when we look at the Western experience, or the experience of these expeditions, or all of these activities that, uh, that represent Western expansion, it shouldn't surprise us at all that we're going to see many black faces and many places, faces of other hues there as well. It was a multiracial experience. And we'll try to deliver that message more as we move towards the tw uh, 21st century. We'll take one last question, uh, if we can make it a quick one. Well, I hope I can make this one quick. I've been waiting to speak for quite a few minutes here. Uh, the information that you, my name is Bossy Jenkins. I'm a private citizen here in Portland. Um, I have a question and um, I have something that I would like to say also. Uh, I'm originally from a place called Tuskegee, Alabama. And if any of you people know, uh, Tuskegee is a city that is very rich in black history and it's taught um, a lot in the information that you shared today is very accurate, um, doctor. Um, the lady asked a question, I think it was her, she asked a question in reference to um, who we think, or who are the Buffalo Soldiers of today? And you gave an answer that uh, you said it may, may not be acceptable by some people, which are the gang and blood, uh, the Crips and Bloods, which uh, <clears throat> I myself, from the history that I know and from what I can see today, I find it a little difficult to understand because of people like yourself, um, other black people that are in the political arena that are fighting for equal justice and rights, um, to me would be considered the Buffalo Soldiers uh, of today. And um, I just like to say the program has been 
quite educative, educatable to the people um, that may not be familiar with the Buffalo Soldier story. And one more thing, they have a book in the government bookstore down on um, Second, right off of Front Avenue in Jefferson, and the book is called Black in the Defense of Their Nation, or Our Nation, and that book was helped published by General Colin Powell, I think it, it was, and you'll find a lot of that information not only about the Buffalo Soldiers, but the Tuskegee Flyers, and um, the I think it was the 49th Infantry or something like that. But um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Dr. Milner, I think it goes without saying that you've helped rewrite history for many of us uh, today in this room, and we thank you very much for sharing your remarks, and we are adjourned.